Hello and welcome to class 11 of the course Organizing in Times of Crises, the case of COVID-19. My name is Hannah Tritting Ulbrich. I'm an assistant professor for business administration, particularly business ethics at Leuphana University Lüneburg. In my research, I am particularly concerned with the responsibility and sustainability practices of organizations. In the following video, I will talk about inequality organizations and COVID-19. This session is guided by the overarching question of which role do organizations play in and for social inequality? The session has four learning goals. First, you should understand what social inequality is and why it is important to study in the context of organizations. Second, you should be able to reflect why organizations should have an interest in reducing inequality. Three, you should recognize the link between inequality and the political role of corporations. And fourth, you should understand how organizations create inequality and why organizational practices that produce inequality are so persistent. If you have read about the pandemic in the recent newspapers or online, you may have come across some commentaries claiming that the virus is an equalizer, as nobody is safe from it, either rich or poor. However, let's reflect on this claim for a second. Let's take the common advice into consideration to avoid the virus. Wash your hands and keep your distance. Sounds like a simple task, right? However, a majority of people living on this planet have only limited access to water. Also, in many countries, poor, underprivileged, non-registered non population relying on everyday earnings will have to decide whether they will have an income that day or whether they engage in social distancing. Similarly, in the German-speaking context, workers in so-called essential yet low-paid jobs like supermarket cashiers, nurses or delivery personnel put themselves at risk when going to work. Yet, with little savings at hand, they often are in desperate need for a steady income. In stark contrast, a small number of riches of the rich accumulates large majorities of the global wealth. The rich get to isolate in their gated communities, country houses, and private islands, having access to the best health systems in the world with sufficient resources of self to self-isolate as long as possible and as long as necessary. This is social inequality. Why the COVID-19 virus does not make a difference in who it attacks, the weapons available to people to fight it are surely unequally distributed. However, why should organizations and organization management scholars care about inequality? One could argue that the reduction of inequality in general, and in particular of this pandemic, is the task of governments. After all, in many countries around the world, particularly in Western countries, Governments or well-established networks of social institutions are designed to facilitate the protection and promotion of the economic and social well-being of citizens. Usually such welfare states are based on the principles of equality of opportunity, equitable distribution of wealth, and public responsibility for those unable to achieve minimal provisions for good life for themselves. Inequality is a global challenge. It is recognized as one of the sustainable development goals. And according to the SDGs, too much of the world's wealth is held by a very small number of people. This often leads to financial and social discrimination. In order for nations to flourish, equality and prosperity must be available to everyone, regardless of gender, race, religious beliefs or economic status. According to the SDGs, only when every individual saves sufficient, the entire world prospers. This includes, amongst other targets, the reduction of income inequalities, ensuring equal opportunities and end discrimination or the promotion of universal social, economic and political inclusion. Solving grand social challenges like inequality requires intra-organizational efforts. That means nation states require corporations and other organizations to fight with them against inequality. After all, organizations are the places where people go to work, get an income, and therefore play a huge role in how lives of individuals progress. But what is inequality exactly? While a plethora of definitions exists, 
A general definition is the degree to which people are considered or treated in equally or experience unequal outcomes. While there are many types of inequality, for example, the access to health care, demographic and economic inequality are particularly relevant in the context of organizations. Demographic inequality refers to unequal treatment based on group membership and or social identity, including gender, race, or class. This also includes inequality in the distribution of resources in the workplace, such as pay, promotions, status, power, influence, and respect. One prominent type of demographic inequality studied in management and organization studies is gender inequality. Gender inequality refers to the unequal treatment of women in organizations compared to men. This research has highlighted, for example, the significantly lower representation of women in various fields ranging from science to politics. Additionally, it has focused on the disparities in incomes between men and women for comparable work and the glass ceiling that prevents women from rising to higher level positions has gained much attention. Importantly, crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic emphasize inequalities that women encounter in the workplace. Given that women generally earn less than men, they are more vulnerable to crises of the economy. This is an example of how two grand challenges link together. You will learn more about these linkages in class 12 with my colleague Ali Gumijai. The disparity that results from the monetary value attached to the possessions and contributions of individuals and in organizations and society is called economic inequality. This includes income and wealth inequality, but also other aspects, including unevenness in the dispersion of resource endowments, uneven access to productive resources, and uneven rewards for labor. However, the reduction of inequality does not mean, for example, that all members of an organization should get rewarded equally. Instead, organizations bring together heterogeneous skills in different levels to produce goods and services of value to consumers. In heterogeneous contexts, such as organizations in which ability and motivation may vary, pure equality would lead to inequity. Instead, each organization must ask itself, what is the optimal level of inequality that motivates members to achieve their capability? For example, the poor rewards for care workers and nurses, also compared to uh, managers of uh, hospitals, in many European health systems has led to a dramatic shortage in care professionals. For sure, the current public appreciation of clapping neighborhoods will motivate those fighting at the forefront of the pandemic momentarily. But in the long run, uneven rewards between those who manage or finance hospitals and those who care actually for the patients will continue to be a source of conflict inside of hospitals and society more general and therefore will be, remain a problem. Coming back to my questions, why organizations and organization scholars should care about inequality. The obvious answer to this question is that organizations and inequality influence each other and organizations are directly affected by the effects of inequality on the social level. Recent rising levels of income and wealth inequality in society have demanded considerable public attention. By polarizing populations and concentrating power, inequality threatens not only social stability, but also the institutions of democracy and accountability. This is a risk for organizations. Moreover, inequality indirectly affects organizational performance by lowering human development in society, which imposes costs on organizations, for example, when they have to provide health care or training to their members and lose productivity. It also directly affects organizations by influencing individuals in their interactions within an organization. For example, when executive compensations are high, employees tend to be cynical and engage less in organizational citizenship behavior. Now, let's talk about how organizations affect inequality in society. First, the positive. Scholars in management and economics widely share the assumption that business firms focus on profits only, 
while it is the task of the state system to provide public goods and therefore ensure human development. In particular, it is the state's mandate to regulate the economy in such a way that business activities contribute to the common good. In this view, business firms are conceived as economic actors and governments and their state agencies are considered the only political actors. However, under the conditions of globalization, the strict division of labor between private firms and nation state governance does not hold up anymore. Thus, today, many business firms contribute to global regulation and provide public goods, including healthcare, access to water, or education. In principle, these are measures that reduce inequalities, and they are usually discussed and researched under the term corporate social responsibility or corporate citizenship. In this sense, corporations play positively an active role in the reduction of inequality in society. However, society has little to say in where and how corporations engage in such practices and which kind of inequalities or whether inequality at all is addressed. Also, it is easy to imagine that many corporations will abandon voluntary activities if the pandemic leads to an even more dire economic situation and when their core business is threatened. Consequently, this is not a sustainable way of fighting inequality and actually it will most likely come to an end because of the pandemic. Not surprising, scholars have rightfully pointed out that business firms by and large rather contribute to the maintenance of social inequality. In a recent article, Babucci and his colleagues have argued that firms do so by the ways they create, capture and distribute value. Organizations create value by drawing on resources from their stakeholders, capture it in a way that gives them a competitive advantage and enables them to finally distribute value amongst its stakeholders. In the process of value creation, the combination and exchange of resources provided by a range of stakeholders takes place. Resources include labor, capital, but also knowledge and reputation. These stakeholders may include employees, but also managers, the government or society. In the value creation process, organizations create, for example, income inequality by paying generous salaries and lavish bonuses at the executive level and simultaneously creating precarious positions with payments at near poverty wages and including little options for workers to fight for a better position. In the process of value appropriation, firms aim to maximize retained earnings. To that end, firms employ a number of corporate level and business level strategies aimed at cost minimization and revenue maximization. Cost minimization includes, for example, sourcing of raw materials from low-cost suppliers with low working standards. Revenue maximization includes, for example, non-market strategies such as the lobbying to reduce regulation and to minimize costs of production. Finally, organizations engage in value distribution. This includes the allocation of retained earnings amongst those who contributed resources to value creation and appropriation. Importantly, while a variety of stakeholders contributes to the value creation and capture of firms, they will not equally profit from its distribution of values. In most large corpor corporations, the principle of shareholder wealth maximization and corporate governance structures have enabled the distribution of the majority of value to executives and shareholders, while employees, government and society are left with limited share of the value. Stakeholders, as opposed to shareholders, often lack the bargaining po power or legitimacy to make claims for equal treatment. For example, due to today's globalized financial market, mobility of capital across borders is high and corporations have developed strategies to forego to pay taxes. Such tax avoidance then leads to less money available for governments to redistribute to human development, which ironically would also benefit firms. This is how corporate value distribution leads to more social inequality. Overall, the business model as we know it 
thus is fundamentally unequal. Its value distribution is screwed heavily towards capital market shareholders of the firm and the, and the principal shareholders. And according to Fabucci and his colleagues, this makes organizations a key source for social inequality. But why are organizational practices that lead to inequality so persistent and why do they prevail? Ahus and his colleagues suggest that organizational practices that lead to inequality, particularly hiring, promotion, compensation, role allocation and structure, uh, are persistent because of the existence of three myths around organizations. So the first myth is the myth of efficiency, meaning there is a belief that organizations are essentially driven by a concern for greater efficiency. That means that various organizational practices ranging from recruitment to compensation are unquestionably assumed to be optimal responses to the uh, pressures uh, faced by organizations. Consequently, deep level inequalities such as the lack of women in the upper echelons of organizations are simply not addressed. The concept of meritocracy implies a widespread belief that individual advancement and the allocation of rewards in organizations and society are based on an individual's capacities and performance rather than on family connection, seniority, race, gender or class. It is the belief that everyone gets what they deserve based on their abilities, not because how they look, whom they know or which networks they have. Finally, the myth of positive globalization is the belief that globalization of organizational activities is an inherent positive and progressive development. And of course, business scholars have taken a part in creating this myth, focusing on the positive aspects that uh, organizations and particular business firms face when they go global. These three underlying beliefs in organizations, but also in society, prevent that organizational practices that lead to inequality become even questions, and that makes them quite persistent. The COVID-19 pandemic opens the eyes for the inequalities that exist in and around organizations. It also raises crucial questions regarding the purpose of organizations and how organizations should function. It particularly also enables us to revise the myths around organizations that exist and to potentially reflect what kind of core beliefs we have about organizations and how organizations work. The conclusions of the session are the following. In Equality exists on the social, but also on the organizational level. While inequality can take many shapes, demographic and economic inequality are of most interest to organization scholars. Organizations affect inequality in society, but also inequality in society impacts organizations. Through CSR, organizations contribute to the redistribution of inequalities, yet this raises crucial questions regarding their accountability. Through so processes of value creation, value appropriation, and value distribution, fir business firms create inequality. And finally, institutionalized myths in organizational efficiency, meritocracy, and positive globalization facilitate the persistence of inequality in our system. Finally, I would like to finish this session with some uh, thoughts about new questions about organizations inequality in COVID-19. First of all, I'm wondering, in the pandemic, there was is a strong focus laid on the economic responsibilities of corporations providing essential services, keeping the business running, etc. Where does this leave more vulnerable stakeholders and what does this mean for CSR? Another question could be, does the public debate on system relevant occupations lead to more equal compensation for low wage jobs or which conditions may hinder or facilitate this process? And finally, I'm wondering whether the pandemic provides a sufficient disruption to challenge institutionalized myths about the positive sides of globalization and the overall functionality of today's global economic system in order to open space um, to for rethinking business as it works and rethinking organizational practices in general. 
this is the literature that I used in the preparation of this course. If you have further questions or are interested in further literature, just get in touch with me. Finally, I would like to say thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoy this session.